Good evening and welcome to the City Manager's Trial Budget Hearing on April the 12th, 2021. This is our 10th budget hearing. We are uh, pleased tonight to be hosted by District 5 Council Member Betty Wardado and uh, we will hear from the Councilwoman in just a moment. First, I'm going to ask our Spanish language interpreter, Mario Barajas, to introduce himself uh, to the audience. Mario? Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mario Barajas. Together with my colleague, Elsie Duarte, we will be serving as Spanish interpreters uh, for today's virtual budget, budget audience. We ask as a favor if uh, you will be providing a public comment, please try to speak slowly and clearly so that way we can try to interpret what you are saying as fully as possible. Thank you. Now, to avoid any confusion, I will review the telephone sign-in instructions for English speakers. Subsequently, I will review the same pertinent information for our Spanish speakers. By uh, your telephone, you will be di dialing 602-666-0783 and enter meeting ID 187-735-3903. Press pound again when prompted for attendee ID. I will now take this time to introduce myself to uh, our Spanish-speaking audience. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas y junto con mi colega Elsie Duarte estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes para la audiencia de presupuesto virtual de hoy. Les pedimos uh, como favor, si es que va a estar dando un comentario público, hable despacio y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para que podamos interpretar lo que esté diciendo de la manera más completa posible. Muchísimas gracias. Ahora les indicaré cómo acceder a la audiencia por teléfono en español si es que aún no lo ha hecho. De su teléfono puede marcar el número 602-666-0783. Introduzca el número de identificación o ID de la reunión que viene siendo 1-87-923-0783. Seis, ocho, y luego el signo de número, o sea, el pound. Y nuevamente va a introducir el signo de número, pound, nuevamente cuando se le solicite el número de identificación o ID de asistente. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mario. And also, Councilman Guardado will be hosting a Spanish language hearing on Thursday evening uh, for District 5 residents as well. At this time, it's my... Um, privilege to introduce District 5 Council Member Betty Wardado. Council Member. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, City Manager Ed. Um, I want to thank everyone who is here today who has taken time out of their busy day um, to be here with us today. This is um, my first full term looking at this budget and, and going through all of this with all of you guys. So it's an honor for me um, to be able to listen to everything that our constituents have to say, to try and figure out how is it that we continue to build a great city and how is it that we allocate resources evenly throughout the whole city, throughout all the districts. And very, and it's always, as you guys all know, everyone that knows me knows that it's always incredibly helpful and good for me to be able to hear from you on what is it that we need that we need um, to make our city safer and to be able to provide everything that we need um, for our constituents. Um, I've read a lot of the comments and we're definitely looking into our libraries. How do we how do we make sure that we have accessibility um, in our libraries during these during these harsh times that we're living in, in right now? Um, we want to make sure that all of our all of our children have access to the libraries and that we continue to better our libraries and that we continue um, to make them accessible to our constituents the safest way possible. Our parks, I have two young children. I have a 10 year old and I have a four year old that enjoy going out to our parks. I know that we're having plenty of conversations in terms of how to renovate some of these parks. We just did a grand opening over at Washington Park a little bit over a month ago. And, and I've been there a couple of times now since, and it's been very exciting to be able to see that. Um, Little Canyon Park is another park that's going under renovations right now. And we spoke to the community out there 
and we're going to have a really cool concept that's going to be coming coming into that little park. So I'm very excited about that as, as well. Historic preservation is another thing that we've heard from constituents and definitely um, looking at that as well. Arts and culture, the more that we can teach our children about art and about our culture, I think it's incredibly important that not to let our roots get lost in, in the middle in the middle of everything that we're living in right now. And public safety. Um, I just got up of, of a meeting with the chief and with and with um, Ask Me 2960 to talk about how do we make things better for our 911 operators. And I know that this is um, 911 operators week. Um, so I want to salute them as well for all of their hard work and everything and everything that they're doing. And I and I hear everyone about public safety and we're de and it definitely something that we're, that we're all gonna that we're all working on together and hoping that we get um, great conclusions around that as well on how do we continue to support everyone through that process. So with that, Ed, um, I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Guardado, for that introduction. You covered a lot of the important parts of the budget that we want to look at in more depth this evening. And to that point, this is a trial budget for community review and feedback. It is our tradition in Phoenix to put out early uh, ideas about the budget present uh, budget additions, and we have many this year. We have about $150 million of surplus resources. A great deal of that is one-time money that we can't spend on ongoing programs, but it is available to do some important things in the community uh, right now. So it allows us to offer um, good wages and benefits to our employees to retain and attract our talent, and also to add programs that the community has told the council are important or that the council has raised as important programs. And so you can find detail on this in a budget uh, section on the phoenix.gov website, phoenix.gov slash budget. It has information that's, off, that's in past years found in a printed book booklet. It's available online for your review. You can spend 15 minutes or 15 hours looking at all the information that's available on this budget. And in just a moment, we'll take a look at a, at a video that uh, highlights it. But there are six main areas of uh, focus this year in the budget in addition to our employees, and those are administrative accountability, COVID relief and response, climate change and heat readiness, growth in the community. We're the fastest growing city in the United States, and so we need to respond to growth in many areas, affordable housing and homelessness, and the largest single area, which is public safety reform and responsiveness. Before we go to the video, I want to thank our staff who are here this evening uh, joining us, our budget and research staff who are present at every uh, hearing, taking notes and minutes, uh, making sure things go smoothly. Amber Williamson is the budget and research director. I want to thank our city employees who are here or online uh, listening and watching uh, what's going on, answering questions, taking notes. Uh, so that we can be responsive. These uh, are broadcast on Channel 11, on Phoenix TV's YouTube channel. They're also then available at any time on the Phoenix TV YouTube channel. We take minutes and distribute them every Thursday to the council so that there's an opportunity for people to see the comments in different, many different formats. With that, we will go to the, uh, it's about an eight minute overview video. It is a high level video. It does not give all the details uh, that are in the budget. But as I said, please take time to go to phoenix.gov slash budget to review that. After the video, we will go to the speakers. We have about 20 speakers who have signed up and we will take those comments at that time. With that, we will go to the video. The City of Phoenix trial budget for fiscal year 2021-22, proposed by the Phoenix City Manager, is ready for public review and comment. The goal of this trial budget is to identify programs and services that build a better, more inclusive city for all. Phoenix has a long history of public budgeting, giving the community a voice in the future of our city by starting the public involvement much earlier than required. 
This year, due to the pandemic, public involvement will be virtual, but our goal is that we will provide even more opportunities for you to share your feedback. We'll host virtual budget community hearings between April 2nd and April 20th in both English and Spanish by council district and citywide for youth and for seniors. And this year, we've launched the Fund Phoenix tool, an interactive way to share what's important to you when it comes to city programs and services. The law requires the city's budget to be balanced each year. And this year, we are happy to report a projected budget surplus of $153 million, made up of $98 million in one-time funds and $55 million in ongoing funding. This is thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council and the city's strategic use of data to direct our efforts during the pandemic. City employees have stood on the front lines of the pandemic more than a year and counting to provide critical services and support to our residents and customers. Approximately 77% of the surplus in the 2021-22 trial budget is allocated to employee compensation, to continue to retain and recruit top talent, to provide the level of service our customers rely on to stay safe, healthy, and connected. $35 million is allocated to address important needs raised by the council and the community across six areas. Focus Area 1 public safety reform and responsiveness. More accountability, responsiveness, transparency, and trust is demanded from public safety programs. In this budget proposal, the city expands an already successful fire department program where trained mental health experts respond to 911 callers needing crisis health services. The expansion of the Community Assistance Program follows community and council requests for innovative ways to respond to crisis calls for service with mental health professionals rather than police officers. This not only strengthens health outcomes, but frees up police officers and firefighters to focus on public safety calls, reducing response times for our community. In addition, the budget adds other important public safety reforms by adding additional 911 operators, reducing wait time for police public records, improving police officer accountability through an improved human resource management system, and more comprehensive reports of crime data. Focus Area 2, COVID response and resiliency. The city's navigated the COVID pandemic well, protecting employees and the community because we have relied on data and contracted public health experts to inform our efforts. We transitioned City Hall to an appointment only model. We also pivoted our programs and services to support the community in need of Wi-Fi connectivity and access to emergency food support and virtual and curbside library services requiring additional staffing and technology enhancements. Funding's required to continue these efforts through the pandemic. Focus Area 3, Climate Change and Heat Readiness. Climate change and the record-breaking heat in Phoenix call for investment in strategies to address the negative impacts on our residents, particularly our most vulnerable, including seniors and those in poverty and experiencing homelessness. The trial budget includes a new Office of Heat Response and Mitigation to focus these efforts, the addition of staff to plant and maintain trees, and advance the city's Cool Corridors program, all to meet the goals of the Tree and Shade Master Plan to double the tree canopy by 2030 and reduce the impact of heat. Focus Area 4, Affordable Housing and Homelessness. The city has a lack of affordable housing and more people experiencing homelessness than ever before. The City Council approved a Housing Phoenix Plan and a Homeless Strategies Plan to find solutions to identify funding to increase and improve affordable housing units and to leverage federal funding and work with community partners to help those experiencing homelessness. Funding will provide staffing and programs to foster affordable housing developments on city-owned land and ensure the safety and security of those experiencing homelessness and the impacted neighborhoods and businesses. Focus Area 5, Building Community and Responding to Growth. 
there continues to be a great need to connect underserved communities to the economic benefits of our city's continued growth. We will fund programs and services that foster equitable education and recreation opportunities for youth and special needs populations, including the Phoenix Public Library's College Depot, clean and safe neighborhoods, and support for homegrown small businesses. Funding will support the growing needs at city parks and recreation centers, including the new Cesar Chavez Community Center, scheduled to open in the fall of 2021, Margaret T. Hans Park in downtown Phoenix, and Deem Hills Recreation Area in North Phoenix, as well as the successful inclusive recreation program for residents with special needs. We also propose an increase in funding for arts and historic preservation grants. Focus Area 6, Administrative Accountability. The city must continue to foster a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment to live and work for residents and employees. To succeed, we propose to create the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We'll also invest in technologies to support data-driven decision-making across city departments and to protect the city's IT systems from cybersecurity threats enhance election processes to increase engagement in city elections and connect residents to library and park services. This has been just a taste of what you will find in the 2021-2022 City of Phoenix trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget available online at phoenix.gov budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at one of our 14 community budget hearings or by email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. Through our Fun Phoenix interactive tool, you can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use the hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. The city manager will present his proposed budget for 2021-22 to the Phoenix City Council on May 4th, 2021. Both meetings will be streamed online and on Phoenix TV. Thank you for being part of this important process. We look forward to hearing your ideas for this year's trial budget and the future of Phoenix. All right. Thank you. Again, we're back at the Council District 5 budget hearing hosted by Councilwoman Betty Wardado. At this point, we will go to our cards, our speakers, and I'll turn it over to Matt Heil, who will introduce this section and call the speakers. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just wanted to read a brief statement about conduct during public comment. Members of the public will have the opportunity to speak for up to two minutes on budget issues of interest or concern to them. Speakers must present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language and personal attacks on members of the public, council members, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules can lose their opportunity to continue to speak. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. And with that, our first speaker is Savina Bavaset. Savina, are you on the line? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Please go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, first off, I would like to take a moment to thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak. Um, I am commenting on behalf of the park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way and really just asking you to consider to add the park maintenance to the budget. I think when you think about the pandemic this past year and how our kids have had to live in this virtual world, I think I've, I've realized more the importance for their health and wellness and our health and wellness as, as working moms trying to homeschool kids, um, the need for them to get out and um, have that playtime at the park. Um, when you look at our area and the amount of growth um, in the Pineo neighborhood. There are seven schools. Um, one of the schools that has the highest enrollment um, in the area due, due to the dual language program. 
there are no parks in walking distance for the kids in this area. So I think the close one is about three miles. So we're really asking you to consider adding that park maintenance, um, especially for our children um, that really, really need um, a place to get out and play. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Garcia. Cynthia, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Um, I'm calling in today in opposition of the um, current budget uh, from the city manager. Um, the crisis program needs to be separate from the current first responder departments. Um, the current one does not have the uh, interest of the people in uh, in mind. Uh, we need a first responder unit that does not run background checks or report drug use or drug possession. Um, the funding needs to be coming out of the police department since we. Cynthia, we've lost your audio. Are you there? Okay, we will proceed to the next speaker. It's Cynthia Graver. Cynthia, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Please proceed. Uh, my name is Cynthia Graber and I live in District 5. My family has lived in Arizona since 1928. I want to thank City Manager Mr. Zerker for all of your hard work and true dedication to our great city. I also want to thank Councilwoman Betty for always reaching out and listening to her community. I love her. Congratulations on a well thought out and prepared budget. I fully support this budget in our police. The role of government is to provide protection for people and property. Not funding public safety is dangerous for our community and would lead to more crimes. I am very thankful for more resources for all of our officers and all of our 911 operators. I also want to thank the city for expanding the climate change and heat readiness program. So many infill projects and walkable urban programs have taken away from our green space. Every tree makes a difference. The city needs to do a better job with our tree selection. There are many trees that provide better oxygen, less water, larger canopies, less maintenance than what we are currently being planted. We need to plan better. Most importantly are our children. Along 19th Avenue, Dunlap to Bethany, we have four grade schools. None of these have active little leagues or base or basketball programs. We need to expand our athletic programs to encourage our children to play sports and to teach them to be part of a team. We need more resources and staffing in parks and recreation for our children. And most importantly, there's one other item I'd really like to talk about. Uh, I am very, very thankful for the resources dedicated to Santa Fe apartments. I have high hopes that get that gated that it will be gated and that that will be given the highest priority. Thank you and I am full support of our city budget. Thank you everyone. And I would like to circle back to Cynthia Garcia uh, to see if she is back on and has audio. It appears as though uh, Cynthia has uh, left the line. So our next speaker is Martin Moreno. Martin, are you on the line? It does not look as though Martin is on the line. So our next speaker is Linda Abeg. Linda, are you on the line? I am. Please proceed. Good evening. Thank you for your time tonight. And um, I want to echo support for the heat mitigation and uh, tree canopy program. Also the mental health unit um, in the budget, I think it's going to be great for our community. I'm also here speaking today to request that you add maintenance amount of about $156,000 per year for the park at 50th Avenue and Samantha in Levine to this year's budget. Um, let me share a few things that make this park a priority. Uh, first, the surrounding communities are small neighborhoods and there are no park amenities because the Samantha Park was part of their zoning stipulations. They didn't build any tot lots or any areas. Uh, second, this park is half a mile from the Loop 202 corridor which contains Levine's first high density rental community, which is going up now, a recently approved apartment complex, Harkins movie theater and more. This is a core area in Levine, yet miles from any city park. Third, this is also near the hoped for tech corridor. The kind of companies that we're looking to attract to this corridor want a place where their employees can work, play and live. 
I can tell you that many of us in Levine, when we plan an outing to a city park, are going to the city parks in Goodyear and Gilbert. Those jurisdictions are prioritizing community amenities and infrastructure, and they are also getting tech companies that Phoenix wants in Levine. I've had the opportunity to speak with developers as I work with on the Levine Village Planning Committee and know that they are that the companies they speak with uh, are looking for places where their employees want to live and that CED recognizes that value as well. When Phoenix leadership doesn't show that Levine is worth investing in in this infrastructure, I'm not sure why great companies would think that it is either. Let's show them that Levine is worth investing in. It's a valuable and desirable part of Phoenix and Arizona. As you allocate money for climate change and heat resilience, please add this park to the budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frank Deaver. Frank, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Please proceed. Hi, Frank Deaver, a resident of District 8, but calling in to ask all the members of the council to please support the park at 55th Avenue and Samantha. Uh, again, you know, the reiterating all the statements that Linda said. I'd like to thank her for coordinating the neighbors to call in and support this. Um, it's a park that we've been waiting on for 14 years since our neighborhood was first developed. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is John Willencheck. John, are you on the line? Uh, it does not appear as though John is on the line, so our next speaker is Amy Meglio. Amy, are you on the line? Oh yeah, hi, I'm here. Please proceed. All right, so hello, um, this is Amy Meglio, volunteer lead coordinator with Grassroots Law Project and a member of the Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program. Um, and before I go on to thank um, Council Member Guardado for her recent uh, vote on the plea contract, I just wanted to quickly fact check the second Cynthia that spoke. Um, in fact, the city's own data shows that over the last 12 years, there's been an inverse relationship. So increased funding has actually equaled decreased safety. Um, okay, so under the speech that I had prepared, um, I wanna thank you, uh, Council Member Guardado, for your bravery and your active dissenting on the 7-2 plea contract vote. Um, we may have lost, but the fact that you voted no rang loud and clear that you're hearing the community like week after week and month after month. And really, that's like ultimately all we can ask for out of these exchanges. Um, so I really wanted to, to thank you for that. Um, and I'm here tonight asking that you hear the community on the issue of crisis assistance in the same way. And since we've been told that the specific language of the ordinance isn't going to be written um, at the time of the budget allocation, I'm wondering if you're willing to commit to only voting yes on an ordinance when it does come that includes language such as will not report to ICE, will not report ongoings um, of calls to Phoenix PD, and that includes an ad hoc committee. I yield my time. Our next speaker is Marcus Reed. Marcus, are you on the line? It does not appear as though Marcus is on the line, so our next speaker is Frank Grenier. Frank, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Very good. My name is Frank Grenier, and uh, I'm not a resident of Phoenix, but I am a volunteer, a proud volunteer at Pueblo Grande Museum. And I'm here continue with the city of Pueblo Grande since 1929. And I'm asking that you support this, of this tradition by approving the staff requests for the museum. Museum staff with 40%, nearly 40% in the wake of the recession of 2008. And it has not improved in the 13 years since then. Pueblo Grande is at, at the part of the city of Phoenix, of this city. Uh, and it is a critical cultural and, and educational hub here. They, they are responsible for curating, protecting, and displaying artifacts that have been left by the humans who have lived here for over 11,000 years. Uh, and uh, they, they need support, particularly in the curation 
collections department. Uh, get the same to, to to focus on uh, hiring good people in order to advance the city's goals. Well, the important thing is also to retain a people who have proven that they are uh, going to support the the mission and the goals of both the city and the museum. And in the collections department, there is a temporary employee who is who is just terrific. And I would ask that you support retaining that position and approving the other. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Schwimmer. Jack, are you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Guardado, for um, for hosting this today. Um, I'm speaking today in support of the $200,000 increase for the um, Office of Arts and Culture that's included in the trial budget um, and in general appreciation for the support that you and the rest of City Council have shown towards the arts. Um, arts organizations and artists in our community throughout the pandemic um, through both the the standard budgeting process last year and this year and um, COVID emergency relief. It's made a huge difference. I work for a cultural organization and with a lot of artists who have received direct funding um, through the city. Um, and so we're, we're really happy to see it once again included and with an increase um, in the trial budget. Um, it helps to ensure that um, we can provide more access for arts programming all around the city and that the community's public art can be maintained um, to provide beauty for all our residents. So thank you again for your support of the arts and culture community and that is all. Our next speaker is Ramon Gomez. Ramon, are you on the line? Hi, good evening, everyone. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you for having us this evening. Uh, my name is Ramon Gomez. I'm a resident of the Levine uh, community, Paseo Point, um, District 8. I'm calling to support the building of the park on 55th Avenue and some other way. I've been a resident uh, going on seven years. And when we first bought the home where I'm living at, it was to be built. So all the, that was the last uh, area being built in, in that community. And uh, you could see the park lot, the school lot, it was all empty. And the realtor told us, well, they're gonna build the, the park, the church is coming and there's a school. So the school has been up, the church is going on strong. And now the last thing standing, which is an eyesore for the community. Uh, it would be very beneficial for the community to have a park uh, within walking distance. Uh, closest park is three miles from where I live. I live right on the edge of Dobbins and 55th Avenue. South of that, you can see all the new houses being built uh, that would also benefit from that public city park. So I am in support. Uh, please consider that um, the budget to build the park. It's a fraction, uh, no more than $160,000. Uh, I know it may be a lot for some and not so much for us in our community, but it is something that's very well needed in our community and it will be very beneficial. It supports some of the uh, ideas uh, that the budget is trying to encompass in the budget. Thank you and I yield my time. Our next speaker is Donna Reiner. Donna, are you on the line? It does not as appear as though Donna is on the line, so our next speaker is Samuel Merton. Samuel, are you on the line? Yes. Hello. Uh, Samuel Merton. I'm, a, I'm with an initiative called the Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program, and I'm calling with questions about the budget for expanding the community advocacy program. So I have in front of me right now the development process for the Portland Street Response Program. That was, that's a new program successfully running in Oregon. Um, we can see that included in their program's funding uh, was a 
was to form a community engagement work group to ensure that the community members are engaged and informed about the creation of the program itself. So they did things like hold listening sessions, meetings, distribute surveys to stakeholder communities throughout the city. Um, things like the listening sessions raise the voices of unsheltered individuals, for example, that are among the most impacted by the current first responder systems. I'm wondering if a similar work group was budgeted for and considered in this trial budget. And we know already that you have committed to working with certain mental health groups and hospitals, but this type of work group, um, which again, successful programs have implemented would be specifically about informing stakeholder communities about the program and engaging with them to find out what exactly Phoenix specifically needs to change and modify to make this program successful in our city. So is a community engagement work group accounted for and budgeted for this trial budget? And would you support an ordinance that guaranteed that was part of the budget before the full budget is approved? Thank you. So Samuel and uh, Councilman Rodato and Samuel, the the uh, budget alloc just simply allocates funds for a program. The program has to be developed yet, and and the council has not uh, had a chance to set up any sort of formal uh, feedback or input process for it yet, and so there's there's no definition around that. But the idea is that that is something that should happen. Is that there needs to be stakeholder involvement and community input into creating uh, the CAP program as it moves forward. So I can't commit to like specific structures, but I do understand and uh, the concept is to include community input, community feedback and stakeholder participation. Our next speaker is Joanne Lowney Copeland. Joanne, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Please proceed. My name is Jo. My name is Joanne Lowney. I live uh, near the historic Carnegie Library, which is on Washington Street near the Capitol downtown. I'm a member of the Friends of the Museum of Arizona Artists. We advocate for the library and its park to become the home of a new museum for Arizona artists, just as so many of these beautiful old Carnegie buildings around the nation have been repurposed to arts and culture museums. The two and a half acre park and the Carnegie Library building situated in its center are owned by the city of Phoenix and leased by the state legislative council. It sits unused and closed to the public. We ask that this property be repurposed as a museum and for the pre-development funds to develop the building and the surrounding park. This car park could be a sculpture garden, a green space at the proposed Museum of Arizona Artists. The park should be upgraded with new plantings of trees and of sculptures by Arizona artists. It would be a gem, a place of destination, historic interest, learning and creativity, a place to see art, enjoy nature, have art classes and performances as a part of the public art programs which could be offered at this, at this facility. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Joel Copeland. Joel, are you on the line? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, City Manager Zerker and uh, Council Member Cordado for hosting this forum and all the staff that's associated with making this possible. You know, my name is Joel Copeland and I live just a half a block south of the Carnegie Library. And uh, um, the Carnegie Library was built in, in, we were very fortunate to have this building. There are dozens of them throughout the country. This was built in 1908 and it was uh, the dream of Carnegie was to use education and community uh, to, and uh, create, to foster creativity and advance democracy. It's a two and a half acre park and building is owned by the city of Phoenix and leased by the state's legislative council for what purpose I do not know because they don't use it. Uh, we organized the Friends of the Museum of Arizona Artists, which are business professionals and arts professionals, and we've toured the building several times and there's nothing in there. It's not even being used for storage. And it's in direct opposition to the Carnegie Foundation's wishes. The Friends of the Museum would like to see this beautiful edifice reopened as the Museum of Arizona Artists under their administration. They are seeking pre-development funding 
from the surplus to help raise the capital necessary to, to sustain our development plan, which includes private donations, public grants, admission fees, and other revenue sources. In keeping with the capital mall plan, the Carnegie Foundation would create an exhibition space for Arizona artists of color, women artists of Arizona, showcasing our indigenous, indigenous cultures and our Latino communities in the South Central. We could build a permanent collection of art saluting our Arizona artists and making a, a space for quiet intellectual viewing. We would also develop programs for at-risk kids and, and economically challenged to understand art and express themselves through art and the creative process. So much could be done and so little is. Help us realize this vision that would lift up the central, the entire central village community as well as the entire city and state. And thank you for your consideration and the generosity of this most recent project. Thank you. And I would like to circle back. It appears as though uh, Donna Reiner was able to connect. So Donna, are you on the line? Oh, yes. Oh, you have to unmute me. You are unmuted. Please proceed. Okay. All right. Well, I am so thankful to be here again and to say thank you for the consideration of additional funds for arts and culture and also for historic preservation because uh, both entities help improve the quality of life, give beauty, and employ a lot of people. They're all economic drivers. And so I want to say thank you very much. That's it. That's what thank you. Our next speaker is Claudia Coucher. Claudia, are you on the line? Hi, I am on the line. Great, please proceed. Thank you so much for listening to us. I am a mom who's lived in the community for over 16 years and myself, just like all the other parents, are asking that you support the park on 55th and Samantha Way. Um, there are no parks nearby. My kids either have to play in a green belt that isn't designed for that in fear of them getting hurt or falling or getting kicked out. We would love to be able to walk or bike ride instead we are um, forced to drive or potentially go to other communities um, after the park we usually have a meal or ice cream or something which are funds that we would love to be able to spend locally in our area but unfortunately just can't because we don't have the park with Harkins and the other plaza coming up, it would be nice to be able to stay locally, support, and be able to walk and see the community built the way it was designed to be built. Um, so I am asking for you guys to support the park on 55th and Samantha Way. Thank you. Our next speaker is William Junkerman. William, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. My name is William Youngerman. I'm a resident of District 4. I'm calling in support of funding for the proposed Museum of Arizona Artists at the former Carnegie Library. I'm on the board for the organization and I've toured the facility. My family moved to downtown Phoenix in 1972 and ever since we've been a fabric of the local arts community in Arizona. My father served on the board of the Phoenix Art Museum's Board of Trustees, the board of the uh, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art and the board of the ASU Art Museum. My mother was a longtime docent at the Phoenix Art Museum and served on the board of the Contemporary Forum, as well as the International Friends of Transformative Art, which was made up primarily of local artists and supporters. I myself served for more than 10 years on the board of the Men's Arts Council of the Phoenix Art Museum, which is the largest support group of the art museum since its inception. Recently, my father was a finalist uh, in the philanthropy category for the Governor's Arts Awards, which took place just over a week ago. He has one of the largest private collections of Arizona artists um, in the state. I also am a collector of Arizona artists. Uh, we know all of those artists personally. Uh, my father has a party every year in which he invites all of those people to showcase their art and get a chance for the people in the community to uh, work amongst themselves to try to further uh, the uh, promotion of artists in Arizona. Uh, we think that this museum is going to be a great opportunity uh, not only to showcase uh, work from artists across the state, but keep in mind that the light rail access, which will be coming down Washington Avenue and heading down to the legislature, uh, combined with the extension of the light rail into South Phoenix, will give access to the 
lower income and minority communities in the Phoenix area, helping them to have an opportunity to experience not only the experience of the arts, but also local Arizona artists. I encourage you to support uh, the MOASA opportunity. Our next speaker is Ainsley Ingenue. Ainsley, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Please proceed. Good evening, my name is Ainsley Anguno, and I'm also a member of the Levine community and also a teacher here in Levine. And I'm asking that you please fund the building and the maintenance of the park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way, um, just making a priority for a safe place for our kids to be able to play outside um, after a year being centered around computers and technology, just um, advocating for them to be able to have places to play outside again. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Tara Loman Rojas. Tara, are you on the line? It does not appear as though Tara is on the line, so our next speaker is Hava Derby. Hava, are you on the line? I am, thank you so much. Um, I am, as well as Sam and Amy, um, calling on behalf of NOCAP, Neighbor Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program. I know you guys have been hearing a lot about it. Um, and I um, definitely want to highlight today, as Sam did, the inclusion of an ad hoc committee in this program. It's super important that we have community involvement and it's something very easy to put into, uh, into writing with this program. Um, and Ed, I, the, these meetings are just kind of, I don't know, there's the, the, the program that has been created by Sam and the team is so deep that I'm sending you uh, an email now inviting you to sit in the room with everybody and um, dive into this because these budget meetings don't really seem adequate to, um, to talk about something that's uh, pretty fleshed out and um, getting support from some uh, you know, wonderful organizations, including Glass Grassroots Law Project. Um, so I've sent you an email. I, I really, I just, uh, boy, you know, another beautiful unarmed black man killed last night. I'm sen sensing a very strong feeling of urgency in um, getting something going that gets our uh, police out of the communities where they're not needed. Um, so I thank you for your time, and I hope uh, we get to. Uh, personally with you soon. Thank you so much. I yield the rest of my time. And that was our last speaker. I've checked with our IT staff, so that concludes public comment. Thank you, Matt. With that, I will invite Councilwoman Wardado to give any closing comments she would like to this uh, budget hearing. Councilwoman. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I want to thank Jeff and Ed for your hard work on this budget. With a city as large and diverse as Phoenix, it is not an easy task to balance out all of our priorities. District 5 alone is a size of Tempe. However, the door to my office is always open. It is only through open communication that we can continue the hard work to move forward as a city. And I know that it's been a tough year. It's been, you know, we've been living through a pandemic um, for the last year and it's and it's been difficult and i can tell everyone i'm listening to everyone i myself have two young children and will never no longer take for granted our parks and our open spaces for our children to get out there and for adults to get out there um so definitely i'm listening to everyone i i, I understand what where many of you are are coming from and we want to do our best to be able to be able to meet a lot of those needs. I'm very excited for this budget on um, everything that's in it. I've listened to everyone and definitely um, there are some conversations that we'll hopefully um, we'll be having with Ed offline to try to accommodate um, some of the issues that were brought forward today. But with all of that, I just wanna thank all, all of our staff for everyone um, to be listening to the community for the last year. Um, this budget has come together because of everyone advocating, everyone voicing their their concerns and voicing, and also voicing solutions, which I think is very important. And I think that um, through the guidance of all of our constituents is the reason why um, this budget was able to be formed. And 
we'll be looking forward um, to our next um, hearing that we'll be having on, on Thursday um, to continue to listen to our constituents and hopefully um, getting making sure that majority of the folks are in line to be able to to be able to support and vote on this budget in May. So with that, thank you so much, Ed, and thank you so much to everyone that attended the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.